Hey everybody, welcome to a uh, cold wintry day in Aurora, Colorado. Um, today I'm going to do a video about where I'm at on the, this Dynamite 3000 lathe. Um, you may hear a little bit of noise in the background. Uh, there's a couple old computer type fans in here for cooling and they're super loud, but my voice is also kind of shot this week. So uh, I'm going to keep this one pretty short, just going to show you where I'm at and uh, talk about some of the upgrades I'm going to do and uh, also hopefully get some ideas from, from somebody out there. Uh, so th this lathe is built mid 80s sometime. Uh, it's pretty stout casting, pretty solid lathe. Uh, it's got the six tool tur tool changer. But I think if I'm creative, I'll be able to actually get like eight or 10 tools on. Um, I switched over to Mach 3. I've got the breakout board and the um, three motor drivers wired in the back. Um, so I'll make a motor mount. For the x-axis here um, it's the only one that I had to change the mount though I upgraded all three uh, stepper motors they were old 80s worn out stuff uh, you can see this is the tool changer motor up here um, right now I just have that set on an x-axis so rotate it clockwise and then as you roll it back on the pawl so the way that that tool changer works is from the factory it actually has a solenoid on the top that was supposed to pull up and light it, rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise. What guys online have figured out is you just spin it clockwise and it's like a ratcheting pole in there. So you ratchet past and then you roll it back onto the pole and it holds the tool rigid. Um, you can just leave the whole solenoid right in place. You don't have to take that out. Um, you could activate it somehow through mock and, and turn it clockwise and counterclockwise. I don't need that level of speed. Um, I just need you know, something that's repeatable. And, uh, if I start making 10,000 parts, I'm gonna farm it out to a job shop anyway. So I don't need that. Um, I also have the Z-axis <laughs> up and running. One bad part about the way I did the conversion, I just bored out the, this, uh, the, the gear little spur gear on the z-axis and I was able to just bolt it right back in. It's a metal spur gear up against a uh, plastic gear which if that plastic gear gets stripped I'm kind of screwed because the parts for these you only find them used on eBay and that's kind of rare in itself. The other problem is uh, speed is limited because of the technology back in the 80s thing they didn't really uh, think about making these things run fast and powerful so I, I haven't been able to get the Z to run. Oops. It's about all the faster I've got the Z to run so far consistently without stalling out the, the motor. So I, I may upgrade that at some point, but then again, I'm not into top speed. Um, so got the, the monitor mounted. We just screwed it down to the, the back of the case. Um, let's see what else have I done. Oh, switch out the light. This thing had a two foot, no, it's in it. Yeah, I guess about two foot, it might be 18 inch, but uh, uh, fluorescent light in the back. That seemed really dangerous to me. Um, so I got a direct replacement, uh, similar to what I did for my overhead lights in here. You don't have to bypass the ballast, you just pop it in, it's an LED uh, direct replacement bulb. It works great, super bright, that's a plastic, housing around the actual LEDs now and I'll probably still put a plexiglass shield around it just to keep anything from flying up and hitting it. Um, let's see where am I at? Uh, I'm taking this arm on the side off a bunch of these parts are going to go on eBay that I'm never, never going to use. For guys that have these factory original and want to keep the original stuff running, a lot of the parts are really good on it. So hey, somebody else can buy them off me, I can make a few bucks and they can keep their old machine running. Obviously those switches up top are a problem for me. I can't reach the top row at all. I can barely reach the bottom row. But that's a casting that they sit in. It's part of the, the casting for the, the, main, uh, the main body enclosure on this. So I can't just take it off. Uh, my plan is I'm gonna leave those buttons all functional. All those switches will still be functional. But I'm going to reroute some to run with Mach 3 and some I'm going to reroute um, to the front of the machine. 
kind of down in this area of the emergency stop. Um, one of the other problems with this lathe is it's got an electric oiling system for the ways. It's on whenever the machine is on. So like right now while I'm working on it, oil just keeps dripping down out off the ways and out of the ball screws because it, it's slowly pushing it out all the time. I'm gonna put that on a push button here out next to the emergency stop. So I decide when it's getting oil and when it's not. Um, so when I'm working on it, when I'm setting stuff up, I'm not just wasting oil. Um, so, so that's that's gotta change yet. Um, I got a uh, trying to see if you can see in the video. I don't think you can see. I'll, I'll I'll move the camera in here in a minute and show. I have an ER40 call it holder in here that I put in. Um, that's what I used on the little Sakai lathe. Um, one side or the other, I'll put a card uh, the video about the Sky lathe. Um, that ER40 call it holder, it you can hold up to one inch in it. I already had the collets and. I didn't want to put a three jaw chuck. I hate center things in a three jaw chuck. I wasn't ready to build a uh, call it closer. This thing has an MT2 taper in it, so I couldn't. Uh, I make the build aluminum knobs for the chairs out of one inch stock. I it's only got I think it's a three quarter uh, might even be seven eighths, but it's not a full one inch bore. So I couldn't slide my stock through anyway. Um, dealing with building collet closer and stuff, I just didn't feel like dealing with an MT2 collet doesn't go up to one inch. So I was going to make my own collet that stuck out more like an emergency collet you use on a 5C. I didn't want to do that. I, these ER40s are pretty repeatable. Um, I, I do need to figure out a braking circuit for the spindle to hold it stationary so the, the motor's holding it while I tighten and loosen it. Uh, so I still got to work that out. Uh, like I say, so you gotta mount the X axis motor back on here and throw some covers back on and it'll be up and running. Um, the, one of the nice features on this lathe is the door here. That really protects your working area, but you can still see really well through the, the glass here. It's kind of weird they didn't have these ends covered, they're just open. I honestly don't know if I'll cover that or not because much like the mill, I'll run a, uh, uh, a, a oil-air combo for, for my lubrication. I doubt I'll run full, full flood coolant. It has full flood coolant capabilities. Um, I just don't really, I, 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 I don't like the mass sin. Uh, for what I do, oil works pretty well, so I'll probably just run, run oil on that. Uh, other than that, I mean, this lathe is, is closed to operational. Um, I'll move the camera around and show off a couple other things, but uh, hopefully this thing will be running. Uh, it, it's kind of the side back burner project when I have some extra time. So it probably won't be running before, you know, middle of December, but I just keep keep tinkering on it when I have time and it's getting real close. Um, the next few days we're gonna be back focused on the, the skid steer project. Um, I got my parents in town through Thanksgiving, so we got the motorcycle stripped down for that, and we're gonna finish up the frame and start getting stuff mounted. Uh, I doubt it'll be running by, by December, but it uh, should be real close. I think I have pretty much everything I need to finish it. So I uh, should be getting real close on that. I got a bucket. I'll, I'll show off all that in next week's video. Hopefully I'll, I'll show all the parts we got. And, um, that that'll be up and running soon. So uh, yeah, let me let me show you around the uh, the the lay a little closer, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll, uh, we'll we'll get this thing running soon enough. Uh, one of the reasons this thing's on the back burner is the little Sakai lathe works. I, I have a lathe that works. It doesn't work great. It's not super fast, not super rigid, but it works. I'm making knobs for wheelchair joysticks. If they're off by fifty thousandths of an inch it really doesn't matter for most people. I, very few people even will notice the difference in an eighth of an inch on one of these knobs. So I can, I can fudge them around a little bit, make them slightly different on there. It's not a big deal. I want something I can be more repeatable on, not just for those, but for other projects I'm working on. Um, so, so this will be a really nice piece in the end. Um, and I'm gonna have, I bought a thing for $300. I sold the controllers the guy had for it for 250 or 60 on eBay. I still have 
probably four or five hundred in other parts I'm going to sell. At least two or three hundred in other parts I'm going to sell off of it. I'm going to have nothing or maybe a couple hundred dollars into this lathe. And uh, I know other people out there, um, uh, Kelvin over at uh, 1210 CNC. Um, we'll do a shout out to Kelvin here. So, up, where are those? Where will the cards go? I'm not good at these videos yet. I don't know where the cards go. But I'll put a little card uh, to Kelvin's videos about his DM3000. Um, he's the guy who kind of watching his videos inspired me to, to go ahead and build one of these because it is a really nice lathe. He's since upgraded. Uh, but he probably had about five grand into his lathe, exact same lathe, basically running the same setup as me uh, for about five grand. So the fact that I was able to do this for basically free, just my own time and, and you know, work on it over a, over a couple months, um, totally made it worth doing. It's, it's going to be a really nice lathe to have nothing into. Um, so yeah, let me show you around a little closer on the lathe. So here's the shot from behind the lathe. You can see that uh, little box on the top is those top switches I'm moving. And then down at the bottom is the mess of factory electronics on the left. Over on the bottom right corner are the three, uh, the three motor drivers, several motor drivers I added uh, that run the X, uh, the X, the Z, and the, uh, the tool turning, or, or the, uh, the tool turret for, for the six position tool changer. One question I have, if anybody's got a suggestion out there, I would love to do spindle speed control through Mach 3. I would like to use the factory board if I can. Um, that's actually the second board in, um, actually the, yeah, the, actually the first board on the far left, the far left board there. Um, is, is the spindle speed control. There's a potentiometer up on the, the top panel the, that controls the speed. Um, it also has a speed override, te plus or minus 10% potentiometer up top there. And it also had a way to run it through its original programmer. My question is that potentiometer varies um, an AC, I believe, 17 volt signal. It, it's definitely AC current though. Is there a way in Mach 3 with a cheap enough driver board to control an AC circuit? Um, my breakout board does have pulse width modulation. Is there another board I can add, or is there a way to completely control the servo motor through Mach 3 inexpensively? I don't want to spend a few hundred bucks on it, at least yet. Um, if there's, a, if there's, a, if the right solution exists, but it's a, you know a few hundred bucks even, I'll do it eventually. But at least I'll get it up and running without that. Uh, so anybody have any suggestions? I'd love to hear it in the comments. Um, even once this lathe's up and running, this is a year from now. You're watching this video. I might not have done that upgrade yet. So uh, if you have suggestions, let me know because I would like to control that servo motor um, with the uh, um, with, with Mach three at, at some point, but it's it's not necessary immediately. Uh, I apologize. I'm gonna jiggle the camera once and bring it back a little bit more. 
hopefully not drop you guys. I just wanted to show how I set up the, uh, you're catching the vertical bandsaw there in the corner. So, on the back here, this is this wiring here is not hooked up to anything that's hanging on the door. Um, that's if I want to run the pulse width modulation on the breakout board, I need to give it a 12 volt DC supply. Here's the actual servo motor that runs the spindle. Um, one nice thing is this can be wired 240 or 110. There's a transformer down here. Uh, that I'm actually hanging the computer off the, the frame I have it on. These servo motors are decent uh, that run these spindles. Again, to, to uh, Kelvin at 1 to 10 CC, CNC, uh, I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, he swapped his out for a little bigger motor. And again, I may do that at some point, uh, but I'd love suggestions on the spindle speed control. Uh, if you saw in the end shot that I had a minute ago, it there are multiple pulleys, so you can run different speed ranges. I can't change those independently though, so um, having some suggestions on how to, how to change the speed through the software would be great. Thanks for watching, we'll see you next week.